Well, good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us tonight. I'm Jeff Brown, and I'm Dean of the Geese College of Business, and I really want to thank you for making it a priority to participate in this important conversation this evening. I want to thank our Access and Multicultural Engagement team and our Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion for co-sponsoring the presentation tonight. This last year has been a painful reminder that we still have limitations on freedom in this country based on race. It's everywhere in society, including business, and most of it doesn't make the headlines. I think it's fair to say that as a nation, we have a lot of work ahead of us uh, to frankly live up to our own national ideals. You know, at Geese, we often like to talk about ourselves and think about ourselves as being a family. And that means a place where everybody is included and treated equally and with respect. And we understand that we are all better off as individuals and we succeed as a college uh, when each of us has the opportunity and the resources and the respect to succeed. So I'm really grateful for the work that our colleagues have done over the last year in this space. And I'm really equally excited uh, by the commitment that has been showed by our campus leadership, including by our Chancellor Robert Jones, uh, who is in the audience with us tonight uh, and who was able to meet with our speaker uh, prior to this event. Um, we are all, I think, collectively committed to making the University of Illinois and certainly this college um, a leader in diversity, equity, inclusion, and being actively anti-racist. You, the audience tonight, have an important role. Uh, in addition to hearing Dr. Perry's remarks, you have an opportunity to pose questions. We are asking that you set those questions through the Q&A feature uh, at the bottom of your screen. Uh, your questions will then be submitted publicly and the whole audience can see them and then you can use the uh, upvoting feature uh, to click on questions that you think are especially uh, insightful or interesting that you'd like to hear answered. Um, you uh, can only upvote once, but you are able to reverse your vote in case you accidentally vote for the wrong question or see one that you like even better. Uh, and what we'll do is we'll keep track of the, the questions that have the most interest and uh, the moderator of the Q&A, Dr. Denise Lloyd, will um, pose some of those questions to Dr. Perry. So it's now my honor to introduce our speaker tonight, Dr. Andre Perry. He is one of the world's preeminent experts on race, structural inequality, and education. He's a fellow in the Metropolitan Policy Program at the Brookings Institute, and he's a scholar in residence at American University. He's also a regular contributor to MSNBC, and he's been published in the New York Times, the Washington Post, CNN.com, many other places. So uh, you very well may have uh, heard from him or read him previously. Uh, his research focuses on race and on structural inequality, on education and on economic inclusion. He's also the author of the book, Know Your Price, Valuing Black Lives and Property in America's Black Cities. We're really proud to have Dr. Perry join us tonight. And as you listen to what I'd say, I'd like you to think about what we can each do individually and collectively as a university, as Geese College of Business, as a community uh, to fight against systemic racism and to move our nation forward toward those founding principles, which were focused on life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Perry and welcome him virtually to the University of Illinois and the Geese College of Business. Thank you, Jeff. I'm also proud to be here. As you can see, I'm representing to the fullest, to the best of my abilities right now. Go, right now. go geese, go geese, let's get it. Um, but it, this is such a critical time in our country where colleges of business must respond to the issues that are on the ground. If we can't figure out ways to invest and to um, help and support um, small businesses and to help transform large corporations um, to do the right thing, um, then, we're, then we're really missing this moment. And so I'm just glad to be a part um, of, of this um, action by Geese. We should not take this lightly. I used to always say 
that um, if we're going to wait for colleges and universities to get their act together on racial justice, we're going to be waiting a long time. But so this event is really a step in the right direction. Um, I'm not going to waste much time. I'm actually going to get into my presentation as a way to introduce myself to you. Um, I make it a matter of practice to show how the research I do impacts my life. Um, it is a, a misnomer that uh, researchers see themselves as dispassionate, disconnected um, people from communities. No, we come from communities. I am a member of a community and I want my research in, um, to show that. And so I'm gonna share my screen. I'm sure someone will alert me if they don't um, see it or if um, there's a problem with advancing the slides. Um, I titled this presentation, Worthy of Investment, the Devaluation of Assets in Black Communities. A lot of this can be found in my new book, Know Your Price, Valuing Black Lives and Property in America's Black Cities, available wherever fine books are sold. Um, as was mentioned, I work at the Brookings Institution where I study black majority cities. Um, and in particular, I look at the assets in them. I also study black majority neighborhoods, but obviously there's too many to put on a map. But here are the more than 1200 black majority cities um, throughout the United States. And you can see they're highly concentrated in the South going along the Eastern um, seaboard. But um, uh, there are some in the Midwest, obviously a few, in the, um, on the, in the West Coast, but I study the assets, the, uh, the housing, businesses, transportation hubs, infrastructure. I look at those assets and I try to measure their value. Um, oh, here we go. Uh, oh, come on. Oh, there we go. Well, like all good stories, I'm gonna start this one at home. This is 1320 Hill Avenue, Wilkinsburg, Pennsylvania. Um, this is where I grew up. And you can see it's boarded up at, at, um, at this time. It's abandoned. No one's been in it for more than 20 years. Uh, the roof is buckling. It's not worth very much. You can actually pick it up um, by agreeing to pay taxes on this home um, to the um, to the municipality of Wilkinsburg. It's a, it's a small black majority neighbor, uh, community surrounded by Pittsburgh on three sides. I grew up not really knowing where Pittsburgh began or ended. Um, it was all blended in. Um, but I'm gonna tell you how I got to 1320 Hill Avenue. See that woman in the upper right hand corner? Her name is Elsie Boyd. I call her mom. As the story was told to me, when I was born, she made a deal with my maternal grandmother that she would take me in and take me to 1320 Hill Avenue, Wilkinsburg, Pennsylvania. Um, my mother was poor. Um, she already had a child. She had already had my older brother um, at 15, had me when she was 17. Um, she, the, it was also in the midst of an economic collapse in Pittsburgh. U.S. Steel was starting to pull out. Unemployment was record highs when I was a, a young child. Um, unemployment was about 20% at one point. And we know that the Black unemployment rate under normal circumstances are about double that of white employment. And so we know that Black um, families were struggling at the time. And mom did what a lot of Black women did during that time. She took in children, filling a breach um, created by economic shocks or, um, or, or, or she filled areas that government or corporations did not fill. She just took in kids. And you can see while I uh, came in and I stayed till I graduated from high school, um, several other kids came with various stays. Some would um, come in for a few days. Some would stay for a few months, some would stay years. I stayed until I graduated from high school, um, but she reared about 12 to 15 kids for um, during um, a variant stint. 
one of the reasons why she had to rear me is this is my father. He um, was a heroin addict. Um, he was in and out of prison. He was eventually killed in prison by another inmate. He was stabbed in the heart uh, in around 7 a.m. in the morning um, before a day before his 27th birthday. He was a young man, young man. And um, I was always told growing up that he died breaking up a fight in prison. Now, in doing the research for my book, Know Your Price, I found that that probably was not true because he was stabbed um, in the morning. He, he was resting in an open area and um, someone got him. Now, I don't necessarily believe all the police reports I read, um, but um, it, the, at least the medical reports suggest that he didn't die in a, in a scrap in a fight. Um, but part of my research, I actually uh, looked at how he lived. Um, and to do that, you had to actually look at where he lived and the conditions in those neighborhoods. And so that's when I started looking at home prices, um, looking at the, the, the quality of homes and neighborhoods. Um, oh, one, before I get to that, I just want to, to share when I was doing the research where he lived in Detroit and Pittsburgh were areas that were redlined. Um, we know that the practice the, of the federally backed homeowners loan corporation that drew red lines around areas that they did not believe warranted um, the, the letting of low interest loans and down payment assistance to those areas. So he lived in redlined areas. He also lived in areas um, where his neighborhoods were destroyed by highway construction and, and, and also through urban renewal. Um, he lived in neighborhoods where there was a lot of predatory lending, particularly at that time in Detroit, a lot of rent to own types of schemes. And then there were uh, restrictive um, um, racial um, uh, housing covenants that, um, where he could not move in the suburbs of Detroit at the time. And so I started looking at home prices also where he lived and, and putting it in today's context. On this chart, you'll see the on the X axis, that's the percent of black people in a zip code. On the Y axis is indicated on top of the bar charts. That's the price of homes in those zip codes. And so you can see homes where the percent of the black population is less than a percent are valued on average about $340,000. And they're about half as much in areas where the black population is 50% or higher. Now, a lot of people intuitively know that and they will say, hey, that's because they were redlined, a lot of other things. And, but a lot, the most common response is, oh, that be, that's because education is bad. That's because there's more crime. But those are things you can control for in a study. And that's exactly what we did. We looked at that absolute price, but we controlled for structural characteristics, the, the size of the home, the uh, number of rooms, um, the, all the structural characteristics. Then we also controlled for neighborhood amenities, things like education, crime, walkability, all those fancy Zillow metrics to get an apples to apples comparison between homes in black neighborhoods and homes in white neighborhoods. So again, apples to apples, what are we looking at in terms of price? And what we found is pretty astounding that equivalent homes in similar social circumstances um, in black neighborhoods are 23% less than their white counterparts on average about 48,000 per home in equity loss. That amounts to a whopping 156 billion in lost equity nationally. And this is occurring all over the United States. Um, as you can see, wherever you see a magenta circle, that's where devaluation is occurring. Wherever you see a green circle, that's where homes in black neighborhoods are actually priced higher than their white counterparts on average. Champaign-Urbana, this is the first time, you're seeing a record of the first time I presented somewhere where it was a positive <laughs> number. So 
actually home values are uh, positive in black neighborhoods in Ch Champaign-Urbana, Illinois. But I just want to put this in perspective to give you a sense of what's going on. Lynchburg, Virginia, 81% difference. Now, if you helicoptered a home in a Black neighborhood in the Lynchburg metro and dropped it in a white neighborhood in, in the Lynchburg metro, it would increase in value 81%. 81%. Rochester, New York, 65% negative. Um, Jacksonville, negative 47. Detroit, negative 37. Um, Chicago, down the way, negative 28%. And again, there are places that are positive. Nashville, plus 10. Wichita Falls, plus 16. Boston, uh, plus 23. Cham Champaign, 20, plus 25. And no, Champagne don't, I'm, I, I, it's positive, but it's no, uh, you're no less racist than Detroit. <laughs> I just want to be clear, but the home values are better. And um, I won't spend a lot of time on this chart, but what this is showing is that the effect of devaluation on upward mobility is stark. So the lowest, the areas with the lowest um, um, devaluation or valuation of, of, of homes in black neighborhoods also has um, also throttles the upward mobility of, of people in those communities. So we overlaid our data with Ross Chetty's work and we saw that um, the chances of children surpassing their parents in, um, in terms of economic mobility are significantly reduced in areas where there's devaluation. And that makes sense for the reason I'm about to show. I'm gonna put this 156 billion in perspective, just so people can understand this. 156 billion would have financed more than 4.4 million black owned businesses based on the average amount blacks use to start up their firms. It would have financed more than 8 million four year degrees based on the average amount of a four-year public institution. It would have replaced the pipes in Flint, Michigan 3,000 times over, covered almost all of Hurricane Katrina damage, and has doubled the annual economic burden of the opioid crisis. I say all that to, I say that last point to say, certainly my father died at the hands of another inmate and his drug use contributed to him being in jail. However, if he lived in neighborhoods, where his homes were valued, he would have had better opportunity um, to go to college, more opportunity to start a business. Schools would have been better because we know that schools finance, um, their, um, the, the school finances are based on property taxes. The, his neighborhood would have had better infrastructure. So certainly he died at the hands of somebody else, but I clearly show discrimination was an accomplice. The valuation was an accomplice um, for his death. This is why I say there's nothing wrong with black people that ending racism can't solve. We're constantly blaming black people for the conditions in neighborhoods when there are policies that have extracted wealth that has influenced the, the people and the condition in those places. Um, and so I always say this, there's nothing wrong with black people that ending racism can't solve. Um, and actually, I'm, um, this is uh, Al Green, Representative Al Green. I'm testifying in, at the Financial Services Committee. And I'm actually, believe it or not, I'm actually testifying again tomorrow to the Financial Services Committee um, on housing discrimination. Um, but in this hearing, we're talking about appraisals. We know in recent um, days or weeks and months that the appraisal industry has gotten a lot of flack for bad appraisers, appraisals um, that, um, that when the owners swapped out their, the black books, the black art, um, and they replaced the owner with a white owner, they increased the, the, the amount of the appraisal. We, we've seen this everywhere. A lot of this is a, a result of our, our research here at, at, at Brookings. But I wanna show you this exchange 
of the denial that discrimination exists. Um, now, if there's any one area that we know discrimination exists, is housing. Lots of data on this. So let me just show you this clip. If you think black people are being discriminated when their property is being appraised, would you kindly raise your hand? One person on the panel. If you think that, for fear that I'm not communicating well, if you think that black people are not being discriminated against when their property is being appraised, if you think they're not being discriminated against, kindly raise your hand. Okay, hands now, we're getting some consternation, I see. Students, faculty, and staff at Geese, let me be clear. We cannot deny racism. This is just, um, it's embarrassing. We have the data. We have the evidence. This, this idea that somehow the owner is the problem is ridiculous. It's that it's part of that white supremacist myth that the conditions of black cities are a direct result of the people in them. I'm going to now, we're going to turn to business um, because we know that people, most people start their businesses using what? The equity in their homes, their individual wealth. And so when you have devaluation, guess what you have? You have less um, capacity to start businesses. Now, Black people represent about 14% of the population, but only 2% of the nation's employer businesses, meaning businesses with at least one in, or more than one employee. Um, only 1% of Black business owners were able to attain the loan in their founding year compared to 7% of white entrepreneurs. Now, um, we know that but those, both those numbers are low because most people start their businesses using the, the equity in their homes or individual wealth. Black entrepreneurs are denied bank loans more than twice as often as their white peers. And when we do get loans, we pay higher interest rates. About half of black businesses survived the Great Recession compared to 60% of white owned firms. And we know we're gonna see similar numbers because of the PPP loan fiasco, because so many black businesses are sole proprietorships. A lot didn't qualify. And by the time the federal government caught up, many of those businesses had to shutter completely. And so, but a lot of the, I'm going to, a lot of the reasons why people say they, uh, black businesses don't get investment is because of quality. They say, oh, because the service is not as good, because the expertise is not as good. So I, just like housing, I wanted to explore that very fact. Here's Dorian Moorfield, founder of owner, founder and owner of Grandma Beads. It's in the Hill District of Pittsburgh, a, a black majority neighborhood. Um, he gets great Yelp reviews, 4.64. Here he's holding up a breakfast state. He, he held, uh, when I visited him, um, he um, he asked his customer, who has the best breakfast stage in Pittsburgh? And they all hear, uh, you do, you do, you do. He's very proud of his restaurant and, it, and the food is great. If you get, get to go to Pittsburgh, um, go to um, Grandma's Bees. It's located in the Hill District, majority black, but is rapidly gentrifying. In, in um, 2010, it was 99% black. Now it's about 80% black. Um, and he's saying now, uh, garbage pickup is regular. They're fixing the street lights, all those different things. And you shouldn't have, well, white people uh, shouldn't have to move in to get these services, um, but that's what's happening. But I wanted to look at business quality, um, just the same I looked at, at uh, uh, housing. And so we got business revenue. We got that from Dun & Bradstreet, and we also got the race of the owner. But we scraped all the business data um, from Yelp, we scraped all the Yelp data to get a sense of quality. And again, we controlled for neighborhood conditions, um, uh, buying power, education. Um, again, we wanted to get an apples to apples comparison. And what we found, black, brown, and Asian owned businesses actually are rated higher on Yelp than their white counterparts. Um, when you control for the business type, then it, there's no difference whatsoever. And, and just um, mo more important, when you look at Yelp, it's more impactful on service industry and restaurants um, to get more coverage there. But 
uh, um, but in general, it's a, a good indi indicator of business quality and particularly the quality of the owner. But as the, as the composition of the neighborhood gets blacker, they get fewer stars. Um, and I'll, here, I'll show you what that, what that looks like. See that magenta circle? That's Asian, black, and brown businesses. And, and that gray line, that's white businesses. As you can see, um, again, on that x-axis, that's the percent, the share of black people in a zip code. As the share of black people increase, the ratings go down and it's pretty linear, just like the housing. In addition, they're getting less revenue, which is saying that customers are avoiding quality in the hood. Um, so revenue drops and it's costing high quality businesses on uh, in, in between one and $4 billion annually, the high quality businesses. Now there's a saying that um, folks in, in the hood used to always say. They used to, uh, at least wh where I'm from, they would say our ice is just, it's cold. Some parts of the, the country you'll hear, our water is just as wet or something, some uh, variation of that, that saying. But the elders knew that if you um, avoid quality in the hood, you essentially force highly rated businesses to compete with lowly rated businesses. You reduce revenue. It hurts the overall development of businesses. And so from, I mean, of, of neighborhoods. And so we should not avoid quality in the hood. And let's be clear, the businesses are, are as good, but our sensibilities are not that our attitudes are impacting um, our, per, our, um, our ability to patronize businesses. Now, um, I said a lot, I'm gonna say how to counter this stuff. Um, um, you have to invest directly in people. Now, if you invest in place and not people, you essentially will um, increase property pr values and people won't keep pace and then they'll move out. So you have to make direct investments in people, um, home loans, business, lo or business loans, grants, all those different things. You gotta figure a way to cut the check to um, um, homeowners and business owners in black neighborhoods. In addition, we need to remove unnecessary bureaucratic barriers in, into um, into business. I don't know how many times I've uh, had to per or judge applications uh, for uh, business owners to get grant money where they had to go through some kind of class, some kind of financial literacy course. What our data shows is that Black businesses don't need this kind of training any more than white business owners, right? Because again, the business quality is the same the lack of investment is what differentiates black businesses and white businesses. And so why create these barriers? Why create these roadblocks? Cut the check. But we do need to invest in place because of the housing devaluation, because of business devaluation, many areas just simply do not have um, the, re the revenues to, um, to animate value in the neighborhood. So we do need to invest in places. And we need to partner with businesses and developers to incentivize renovation in black neighborhoods. I, in my book, Know Your Price, I have a whole chapter on buy back the block. And what that is saying that we need to um, um, concentrate businesses in black neighborhoods um, so that the, those benefits can bleed into the neighborhoods. And we also need home ownership programs next to those commercial corridors so that folks aren't displaced. And, and, it, and, and this goes without, uh, I, sh I shouldn't have to say this, but we got to divest from racism. We need to remove the, the policies that extract wealth from communities and install anti-racist policies that encourage inclusion. 
Now, what if we do those things? I want to just give you the possibilities nationally. You know, I said this earlier, Black people rep, uh, comprise about 14% of, of the businesses, I mean, of the population, but only 2% of the nation's employer businesses. If those businesses were the equivalent of the Black population, there would be an additional 800,000 more businesses um, to the economy. Um, and here, St. Louis actually has the best representation of black businesses compared to the population, but most places it's waning. Um, it, you know, it's 2.2%, but St. Louis got something going on there. Um, uh, I'm gonna give you some other projections. Um, currently black businesses bring on an average re yearly revenue about 1 million compared to non-black businesses of 6.5 million. If black businesses increase their average revenue to the level of non-Black businesses, we would see an increase of revenue by $676 billion. If the average employee per Black business is increased to 23, which, which is the non-Black business metric, approximately we would add um, 1.6 million jobs to the economy. If Black businesses paid as much as non-Black businesses, we would add um, a, a, an additional 25 billion in pay um, and so for sole proprietorships, they, they represent a big chunk of businesses. So they're about 14% of, of, um, of, of businesses, of, of businesses. Um, if we could figure out a way to inc or to convert um, those businesses to, um, uh, to employer businesses, we would need to convert 27% of those. I'm sorry, I got a little jumbled there. But we need to convert 27% of the employer or of sole proprietorship to, to employer businesses to reach parity. Um, and, and I just want to show you where sole proprietors are. The top three industries are personal and laundry services, transit and, and ground passenger transportation, administrative support services. Um, and, and just to put this in perspective, in the utilities, there are only 18, only 18 black owned businesses in the utilities, one of the largest revenue gr um, generating firms or uh, um, industries, only 18. So we, we certainly want to support those mom pop businesses, but we need to figure out a way to target businesses who want to um, start up in high growth industries. Um, my, I'm gonna close here with an offer to you all. Um, I've just launched a, 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 a challenge competition. I'm working with the Ashoka organization. We're going to give away a, a million dollars worth of prize money to individuals who want to solve for devaluation. So if you have a new mortgage product you want to um, test out, um, we want to hear about it. If we want, if you want to, uh, if you have a new credit scoring system, we want to hear about it. If you're developing new zoning ordinances, we want to hear about it. And so we've already started mapping for innovations. I'll put the link to this challenge competition in the chat. We officially start accepting applications in the summer, but we already started mapping innovations all across the country to find the people who might be involved in this competition. So um, those who are entrepreneurial in nature, check it out. And again, you can find a lot of this research in my book, Know Your Price, Valuing Black Lives and Property in America's Black Cities available wherever fine books are sold. But um, I'm really looking forward to having a conversation. I put a lot out there, um, but um, I'm looking forward this, to this conversation. I believe my colleague, uh, Denise, is, is going to join me for this next session. Absolutely. Wow. Thank you so much, Dr. Perry, I'm doing our Zoom round of applause for you. And uh, 
all of the incredible ideas that you just shared with us. We um, so appreciate your time and, and what you said resonates with me on so many levels. And I really value you personalizing it, right? Bringing yourself into the conversation. And so I'm going to build off of that. Thank you, thank you. Um, and share a little bit about uh, the sp spaces where it really resonates and connects with me. So um, I live in Bronzeville, which is the community in Chicago and uh, live in a, that primarily black, majority black community and um, am married to a spouse who is a business owner in the community. And for myself really only truly made the connection and, and you know I have a PhD <laughs> between that lack of valuation of the property and the inability to get loans to build businesses in these communities and so I love the connection that you are helping all of us make between the home ownership piece and the devaluation and the impact on black business generation and then further really when you where you were ending with helping us see as a society what we are losing, how much racism has cost this entire society, all of us. So I just truly appreciate um, your. And, and you know, by, by the way, it, it's interesting because I've spoken to a lot of business schools and, and a lot of places they really don't see the connection between housing, social justice issues, um, and business development, and but they're all inextricably linked because if you're extracting wealth, you're you're reducing capacity. Absolutely. So I, I so appreciate you. That was one of my questions. In case you didn't make that explicit link, but you really, I think, made a very clear link. So with that, let us get to lots of questions that are being asked um, from our audience. So. You've started to talk a bit about uh, solutions, and I think that there's lots of questions. That, you know, the, the good news is many people are incredibly interested in understanding how they can play a role in helping to make change. So, what solutions do you think might be enacted on the state level? Anne is asking this question to make a true difference in rectifying this kind of inequity. And as a corollary, Denise is asking, is there, are there issues with corruption in government spaces that might also be connecting to some of the disparities that we see? So. Well, okay, when you say correction, like correctional facilities? No, or... no, not correction, corruption. Oh, corruption. Yes. We are... you, know, you know, I mean, I think I'll start with the, that piece. When it comes to, um, overall black development, we often point the finger at corruption. I mean, that that's always an issue, but um, remember that it was completely legal to discriminate against black people. It's that form of corruption we really, that are at fault is the, 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 the systemic racism that extracts wealth from individual is much more of a problem. Um, and so it's sort of the normalized sort of corruption <laughs> in that regard, that um, bad appraisals, bad um, um, real estate agent behavior, bad lending. See, we, you know, we try to um, abdicate responsibility from dealing with structural is issues oftentimes by saying, well, that governor stole or that mayor did that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and while that is true, that, you know, th th that's always a problem. But the deeper issue is the systems. You know, I, I also say this, that it's, we should stop blaming people and stop and start blaming ideas and policies. When I say there's nothing wrong with black people that ending racism can't solve, it's about addressing the policies. And so when you start playing the blame game on individuals, and certainly there are people that deserve our ridicule, our shame, they need to be blamed. But 
it's these systems that we need to worry about. And, and of that, when you're talking about, I'll start on a couple of levels. When we're, you know, Illinois is interesting because they, um, in terms of the marijuana, the um, industry, um, they started off saying, we're going to be the most equitable um, uh, marijuana industry uh, or produce the most equitable system. And you saw what happened. Fewer, few, if any, I, I, I want to say no black owned um, uh, dispensaries were created in that first round. Um, and, you know, you're like, how can that happen? Um, but it's these systems. And so, but the larger issue is we need to change ecosystems where um, those who have been disenfranchised by housing discrimination, um, criminal justice issues, um, business, a lack of business loans, we got to put those folks first in line. There's no way around that. And um, we can figure out workarounds, but at the end of the day, if we don't address race, we're constantly going to be in this position where states well-intended say, hey, we're going to create an equitable system and it doesn't happen. In addition, I do think we, this is the time to really look at a procurement um, issue, supplier diversity goals. This is the time where we should reevaluate and heighten them because we got to figure out these levers to force investment in the black firms. If we increase the demands for government and corporate supplier diversity, we, we kind of encourage investment in black business. So for me, it's also about leveraging state policy in that regard. Um, there's other things, other, remember things like appraisals are regulated at states or cities. So um, appraisals, we need to hold bad appraisals, uh, appraisers accountable, but we also need new systems. Um, because again, this is not about individual racism for me as much as structural. And so what systems are we going to create in order to, to, um, uh, to have the kind of um, equitable systems? Again, the, the, it, things have to be anti-racist, meaning we need to constantly weed out the structures that produce racist outcomes. And um, we also, and we need to replace them with structures that encourage inclusion. Absolutely. Thank you so much for that. Um, I wanted to ask about um, the role that Black banks can play in this conversation. So I recall when my husband, now husband, bought our home 25 years ago, he could not get a loan in this Black community for this, the mortgage from one of the large banks and he ended up getting a loan from a black bank. So Albert asks, is the increase in black run of black, oper black operated banks one possible solution to providing more opportunity or to creating further segregation? I mean, I, I, I look at it this way, black banks in general um, are um, let out loans um, in similar situations to black people more, black people are more likely under similar circumstances to get a loan from a black bank. Because black, most black banks, there's only about 20 of them around the country. It's not like a large amount of black banks. There are more black led CDFIs. So I'll, I'll, I will include them in the mix. Um, and so um, we know that community facing financial institutions know their customers. They know the communities. So we need more community facing financial institutions. Um, but there are so few black banks that, and they're not built for high volume. They're really high touch, low volume institutions. So, um, and we saw this during the PPP loan fiasco. Um, so mainstream banks really need to learn from black banks. And, and 
we need to figure out ways to build capacity of neighborhood facing banks and, and black banks and, and black led CDFIs in particular. And so um, at this moment in time, when, when we were uh, dispensing billions of dollars, I was saying, hey, we got to figure out a way to build capacity of these banks. If you give to a fintech company, they should give some uh, capacity to a black led, a black led bank. That we got to figure out ways. If we're going to give to a privileged class, then there needs to be a responsibility in that giving. Um, and so we should be asking for capacity building for black led banks. But no, we're not going to black bank our way out of this. That that's not going to happen. I say also the same thing. Um, we're not going to nonprofit our way out of these problems either. At some point, we need corporate America to step up, and and they have. I mean, corporate America has stepped up in a in a lot of ways. I'm mean, actually for the first time that in my lifetime, I'm 50 years old. I I've never seen corporations essentially recognize the importance of racial justice like we're seeing now. I'm worried because you know a lot of these funds. Um, we see all over the, they're, they're, in my opinion, they're more charity than in investment. Um, if they were more investment, they would say, hey, we're going to invest in developing more utility firms. We're going to um, target in certain neighborhoods. We're going to make sure that um, we're going to incubate a certain number in this particular field. You know, but more, it's more what we're seeing now is more, hey, we want to support Black businesses. And, and as a consequence, they're spreading these funds like peanut butter very thinly over large areas. And so we're going to look up in a couple months and say, what happened to those hundreds of millions, of billions of dollars? And, you know, and so for me, I've been encouraging, let's be targeted in our approach. Um, yeah, so yeah, we're not going to in general. Uh, we need to support black banks. I want to be clear. Yes, <laughs> it's um, but it's not the the be all end all. Uh, so you were just talking about how certain industries that may have more resources or get more. Um, benefits should have some responsibility yeah. and you've mentioned uh utilities as an area where there are very few 18 <laughs> it's like that the, yeah well by the way number. we should start up some new utility firms in texas let me be clear let, let, let me i just want to uh, and i'm gonna i hope i don't uh, upset people what happened in texas was horrific um, when deregulation is out of control, this is, these are the kind of things that happen. And so when greed runs the, or is the sort of the motivation, this is what you end up with. And so, yes, we need new firms in the utilities. We need new firms in manufacturing. We need new firms in the tech sector. And we and, and and but we don't need the same old kind of philosophies and systems to replace them. Putting a black face on the same product is not a good thing. And so we need new businesses and new approaches to business. And so um, yeah, I mean, or we're going to continuously see these tragedies time and time again. Yeah, thank you for uh, mentioning that tragedy in Texas. I mean, dozens of lives were lost yeah, yeah. Um, over something that I think many of us who were not in that space have a hard time truly understanding how that could happen in the United States of America. But you know, Denise, this is what's interesting. Um, it's during these tragedies, and I lived in New Orleans during Hurricane Katrina. Uh, we saw it during this um, pandemic 
we see how they expose the inequalities in our communities. And, and it's not necessarily the tragedy, but who gets to rebound quickly where you see um, who, who recovers quickly and who doesn't. Because these tragedies, if you are a business owner and that had the shutter and you didn't get that PPP loan, you didn't get relief, there's no coming back from that. If you were in Texas and you have a $5,000 electric bill, I mean, that can take you out for years. If you, had, if you were in, in New Orleans, I know this well, and you had to um, evacuate and you didn't have the resources to come back, you were shut out from the recovery. And so these economic shocks reveal our infrastructure, um, our, our, our racial history, our um, ability to rebound. And, um, and so in all tragedies, there is an opportunity to change things. But if we don't address these structural issues, we'll be talking about, I'll be back at Geese talking about the same exact thing over and over again, how we did not address the the structural problems um, that we have. Let me take a chat, a question from the Q&A that's been upvoted um, from Yvette. How do you make effective targeted investments in places without participating in gentrification that drags out black residents? Yeah, that's black why, communities? Yeah, that's why I said you almost have to have a strategy that invests in people. When it, it, it's, it, it should be an ownership strategy because no one complains about gentrification when you own. It's when you can't benefit from new development and, and new populations moving in. Um, that's when it becomes a problem because uh, you're not going to see the revenues that come about. You're, you, if you don't own a home, you don't, your home values don't increase. Uh, someone else's does. Um, if, if you're not a business owner, you don't reap the benefits. So the goal should be to uh, create new owners um, and we should have zones, um, new zoning ordinances that will help um, neighborhoods near um, existing neighborhoods and existing homeowners and existing renters um, to weather the inevitable spikes in property values. And so, um, but you know, too often we just invest in brick and mortar and that's it. We say, because, and, and particularly mayors and city councils have this tendency because they want to be able to say, look at the new buildings, look at the new people moving in. But oftentimes that comes at a loss of, of current residents. And so for me, you know, we, we should not just want shiny new things. We should not invest in brick and mortar, invest in people. Remember, we got out of the depression by essentially investing in low income people, but they happen to be mostly white. <laughs> and, and, and our recovery thus far really has been a result of, I um, mean, and during this pandemic has been a result of stimulus. Um, we would have collapsed without that stimulus. So, but the problem here is what, what kind of stimulus package do you produce for a population that's been socially distanced for generations? What does that kind of stimulus look like? And so for me, we do need to repair. You can call it reparations. You could call it stimulus. You could call it whatever, but um, you know, many people have been socially distanced for a long period of time. Yeah. Um, so we need to all, always repair um, with some sort of stimulus and relief. Uh, that the point that you were making at the end about generations ties very nicely to a question that's coming from Nathan, who says he lives in Tulsa, Oklahoma. 
which had one of the greatest black owned economic developments in US history, Black Wall Street. Yeah. Question is how important do you think it is to tell that story and how can we get a community like that back again? You know, I'm actually um, involved in a lot of projects that involve Tulsa. And um, for those who don't know, um, Tulsa, Oklahoma, the Greenwood um, community suffered one of the most horrific tragedies in US history um, where the local, a local mob essentially burned down a town um, because it was doing well economically. Um, many of the white workers in those places, in those black businesses, um, going Black Wall Street essentially plotted against them and the Klan and others burned down this um, bustling neighborhood. Um, but while Black Wall Street gets uh, um, a foot, I mean, more footnotes in history than others, this is happening in Richmond, Birmingham, Pittsburgh. I mean, this is happening all over the place. And to a certain extent, it's happening now. You, you know, um, certainly a bomb can wipe out um, uh, blocks of a town, but a lack of investment from the federal government, government can be as debilitating. <laughs> and so we need to show that we can restore Black Wall Street. We need to do that. Um, because if we don't, we're essentially welcoming these kind of destructive acts over and over and over again. Um, and so for me, it's about holding people accountable um, for policy now. I mean, there's still, uh, obviously January 6th showed that there are people willing to take violence to another level. And so we still need to worry about that. Um, but I really do worry about um, policy, um, the bomb of policy, hurting black and brown communities. Um, yeah, so we, we need to, 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 to um, hear the story of Black Wall Street, but we also need to hear the story of devaluation. We also need to hear the story of the PPP loan fiasco. These things have destroyed communities. Oh, you're, you're muted, you're muted. A joke, it has to happen at least once in any Zoom interaction. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> um, this question comes from Mark. So one of the primary ways Americans are supposed to be able to build generational wealth, which is through home ownership, is not readily available to many black Americans. And with respect to business, it's also harder for Blacks to create wealth. Do you have a framework around wealth creation for Black Americans? Yeah. Does undergraduate and graduate continuing education provide any hope? And what other levers beyond education opportunities? Yeah, I'm gonna to talk to the students here. I, I'm, I'm gonna release a report um, in probably like three days, and it is going to make the argument to cancel student debt. Um, now, a, a lot of folks um, feel that's a regressive policy. What I look at this a little bit differently. We show that because of wealth loss in the black community, um, we have many, many black middle class folks PhDs, engineering degrees, medical degrees that have significant um, student loans compared to their white counterparts because they didn't have the wealth from the start. And so when people say, no, you're essentially going to help um, white um, and middle class folks if you cancel debt, I say, well, if you look at income, yes. But if you figure out ways to look at wealth, no. We need 
to cancel the debt of wealth poor individuals, whoever you are, you know, but, you know, because of redlining, because of our um, uh, biased criminal justice policies, because of the lack of business development, black people have less wealth. And so when you have an economic shock, you take a hit, you're taking out more loans, you take longer to pay back. And if you show one, um, I should have added this in there, whenever I talk to universities, I always love showing student, uh, student stuff and I should have put it in there. But um, black people as they age, as we age, we're not accumulating wealth. You know, and, and, and a large part of that is student debt, student loan debt. So we gotta figure out ways to work wealth, not necessarily means testing because there's a lot of problems with that, but we need to examine wealth. We also need to increase home ownership. There's no way around that. Um, um, we need new loan products. One of the reasons why we have this um, challenge competition, there are many places like Detroit, there are literally thousands of properties priced below a point that a bank won't uh, loan, a bank won't back with a loan. And so um, um, we need new mortgage products so that we can convert low um, income renters and make them homeowners. Mm -hmm. We also need to invest in, in um, um, biz black businesses, in black neighborhoods. In, in fact, we need to invest in businesses in black neighborhoods in general. You know, I always look at the devaluation of assets in black neighborhoods. Everyone's hurting. And I mean, black people aren't are the only ones in black neighborhoods. Um, and so everyone is devalued in black neighborhoods. So we need to encourage investment in black neighborhoods, but we do need to make sure we increase the percentage of employer businesses. I'm working with an organization called Cap EQ and um, we are, there's this um, effort called 1555. And that effort is to increase the number of the percentage of black owned employer businesses. Um, and so um, I'm working with them on, on that issue, but um, at the end of the day, it's about investing in black assets. Nothing grows without investment, nothing. I don't care if it's education, business, housing, nothing grows without investment. And so we need to target investments um, in specific ways. And, and, I, you know, and, I, and I meant what I said earlier, we need to look at the industries, the areas, and have a targeted approach that this sort of, um, and I don't want this to sound mean, but it's, you know, we know that black businesses need support, but we need to look at growth. We really need to say, okay, how how is this investment going to maximize impact in neighborhoods. There's some businesses that just won't do that. And so for me, it's about being clear out, using um, data to help figure out what are, what's the best strategy to make targeted investment, not this charity model. Oh, um, black businesses are suffering. You know, black biz businesses don't want charity. They want investment. <laughs> and we need to make that clear. You've mentioned redlining several times. It came up in your slides. You just mentioned it and you were responding to the question before. Could you explain a little bit more for those here who maybe are not as familiar with that term and the history? Yeah, a man. Bit more so, about that. So, um, during the New Deal, um, Roosevelt really tried to come up with interesting ways to get us out of the depression, to provide a level of social security because we recognize that these economic shocks are gonna occur and we can't just, I mean, I mean, can you imagine it, it, it COVID without the federal support? What would happen to the economy? 
But that's exactly what happened during the Great Depression. Um, Wall Street collapsed. Um, you saw, I mean, massive unemployment, massive hunger, massive crime. I mean, it was out of control. So to rectify, we needed to figure out a way to provide stimulus and security for a hurting country. And just like I said earlier, the fastest way to do that is to invest in people. So one of, and the, one of the most profound ways to do that is to invest in home, home ownership. We, the, the depression suppressed communities big time. So we needed to figure out a way to invigorate them. Um, FDR really thought, I mean, this is a good idea in principle. Let's kickstart the economy by making sure people can um, use low interest loans to restart communities, to, to fix up their homes, to move to new communities. Um, and it worked. Um, those areas that were deemed worthy of investment that, and, and they literally drew green lines around those areas um, and people who lived in those areas or could get loans in those areas moved there and they green lighted those loans. Um, but there were areas that happened to be majority black places that were to say no loans are gonna go here. They're not worthy of it. Um, it's too risky. Um, and they drew red lines, literally red lines around those neighborhoods. That was redlining. The problem with that practice is that the folks who were able to get those low interest loans as eventually owned homes. They could pass on the wealth gained to their children and to their children. Those children could go to college easier, start businesses easier. Uh, well, um, my family, uh, you know, could not get, I did not have the benefit of having that equity. So I had to take out loans to go to college. Um, I had to take out loans to do X, Y, Z. So um, wealth um, gives you the cushion um, that during times like this, people lean on their 401k, their home equity, um, their, their savings, all these things. But if you don't have it, guess what you got to do? You got to take out debt. You use credit cards. Your hospital bills go up. Um, and even for student loans, um, another form of uncollateralized debt, you know, a, you know, if you don't have loan, you're just taking on a lot. And so um, I know there's people out there who are like uh, watching right now going, wow, I mean, that's me. I'm the person. I'm, you know, I just don't have the wealth to cover myself all the time. But redlining did made a lot of that happen. But I actually think there's something worse, believe it or not, than the material loss. It was this practice of saying that black people are too risky. And that carried over into business, into employment stuff and all kinds of things. Black people were deemed too risky. And um, that became sort of a mindset um, um, in our society that encouraged higher incarceration. Um, I mean, it was just, it just became a, a problem. So for me, redlining was one of the most violent, most violent policies we've seen in American history. I mean, you have slavery, you have Jim Crow, you have um, a criminal justice system, red linings right there. I mean, right there. And the way you talk about it, it's almost a, a self-fulfilling prophecy. So you divested in those areas and then said, well, the areas clearly are not succeeding. So they're not worthy of further investment. That, that's exactly right. And, you know, and then you get this spiral. And this is what happens with devaluation. The, the, the prices get so low, then people come in and buy the property up. And all of a sudden, the, the, 
the values go up. And that's, you know, and that's what we see everywhere. Um, you know, and it's, and it's a shame. And, and that one chart where you saw that linear decline in home values in black neighborhoods, I mean, it is real. When white people start moving in, home values go up. I mean, not, I mean, it, it's, it's insane. You know, white people aren't worth more. <laughs> They're not, uh, you know, homes don't just increase in value like that. You know, and so um, we've got to change this perception. And that's why, you know, one of the, somebody asked me the other day, I was talking with um, some um, corporate leaders and they asked, man, I love how you incorporate personal story. And a lot of, I do that with everything. I, I incorporate, it, it's either myself or others. Because I say, and I say this all the time, there's certainly a rhetorical power in numbers and data. The data is powerful, but people feel the personal story the narratives, because we got to change that narrative. My father, who was a heroin addict, um, who went to prison, I share his genes, you know, like I get it from my dad, actually, you know, I get it from my dad, but his story was different. You know, it took a different trajectory and but he wasn't a bad person. I mean, certainly he made bad choices, but those choices were set up for him. <laughs> you know, uh, you saw Biggie Smalls, he, there's a couple lines, you know, he talks about either you're selling crack rock or you got a wicked jump shot talking about being in the hood and getting out. And that was true in a lot of places um, that, um, there was just so few opportunities in a lot of areas. And so my father lived in those areas. If he would have lived in, in other places, it might have, it probably would have been different for him. Yeah. He might be talking to you instead of me. You know, so, um, you know, but that's the sad reality that that's why we need to tell these stories that right. it's, we do need to make a head case. We're at a university. We do believe in facts, but you also need to understand how this plays out in the lived experience. And that, and actually, I run my data through the lived experience. Um, um, that's where I get the, our ice is just as cold from. I actually tested that theory. Right. You know, I didn't do it uh, after the fact. I actually okay. Our ice is just as cold. Let me let me test that out. Let's see if the elders are right, and they were. There's a question here from Joshua about this question about targeted work, you know, targeted investment and targeted programs. So, do you think it's better to use? And it's clear that you don't. So I think the question I want to phrase is really, why is it not better to use loosely targeted programs that provide greater support at the bottom of the income or wealth distribution, like a universal basic income versus more tightly targeted programs to specific neighborhoods? Why is it that you are focusing on this? You know, I just think that we were targeted, if we were honest, we were targeted about creating the wealth gap. We targeted white owned businesses. We targeted white homeowners. We targeted white neighborhoods. Let's be honest about that. But, and there, but there are some things that I believe in universal approaches. So, you know, I'm a big fan of baby bonds. Um, Derek Hamilton and, and baby bonds work. I actually believe in sort of a, um, a, fe uh, a federal work guarantee to a certain extent. Um, there's lots of things I believe, but I also don't think we should shy away from race and racism. And there, there's only so many workarounds to this. You know, from my experience, at some point, you've got to address race and not 
Hi. I mean, um, I get in a lot of conversations about reparations, and it's frustrating because there's a lot of people who say that don't, they don't believe in reparations. I say, that's nonsense. That's bull. We all believe in reparations. We just don't believe Black people should have reparations. We've get, um, um, Native Americans have received reparations. Um, the Japanese, who in, in turn um, during the Second World War received reparations. Hell, even 9-11 um, victims receive reparations. I mean, just this past, this, this past epidemic, people were demanding the federal government provide support and relief. And again, I pose this question. What does relief look like for a population who's been socially distanced? And, and so again, it's like we believe in these targeted approaches. But when it comes to black people, it goes, no, let's 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 worry about everybody, not just black people. And it, it's just it's just crazy. I mean, in some ways, the PPP loan program um, was really ignored black people. <laughs> so I mean, it was like them saying, well, let's just go with mainstream banks, and that's just it. I mean, not understanding the damage that would cause. And so this, when we use these, um, everybody is a default, what we're saying is we're going to help white people. Or I, I should say, I should be clear in my language, we're going to privilege whiteness. Not all white people benefit, but whiteness does benefit. And so for me, it's like, Let's stop pretending that we don't do these targeted programs to increase racial divides. What I'm saying is, at some point, you got to invest in Black neighborhoods and Black people. There's no way around. So the point about reparations is directly tied to a question from Hayden. Uh, do you think the strategy used by the Evanston City Council is the path forward? which is using taxes from legal marijuana sales to fund loans for first time minority home buyers. Um, I'm more of a fan of federal government doing um, uh, supplying reparations, but with that said, local municipalities also contributed, particularly in housing, um, to racial inequality. So I also believe that local municipalities um, can create systems that create funds to support disenfranchised groups. I'm, I'm, I'm all for that. And it can be in uh, the marijuana space, it can be in the housing space, it can be in a number of spaces. So I'm all for that. Um, I just think that there's limits to what municipalities can do, but they should do something. They should do something um, because we're all involved. So. Um, local municipalities, states, and the federal government um, should play a role. There's another question about uh, green energy. So can innovations in the green energy space help increase the value of personal property and, and impact? Well, I mean, there's a, I mean, actually, um, environmental racism is, is a contributor to wealth divides because um, black people are often located in environmentally undesirable places on, on, by design. And so if we're looking for green solutions, they must in, in, um, be um, impl, um, based upon serving those communities, employing those communities, um, preventing those communities from being displaced. Or um, um, And so I do think a strategy of um, a there's a green strategy um, that we can use to to help close racial div um, divides because if you look at that map um, or that original map of majority black cities, it's along the coastlines, right. the Gulf Coast, the East Coast, and so when you're talking about coastal erosion, um, hurricanes, all these different things. Um, and black people so afford the insurances, um, all these dangers. So we need 
strategies to um, help black co um, communities who are, that are vulnerable to environmental disasters. So, um, and I just really believe in that, uh, that a good green strategy will take those um, issues under consideration. Yeah, to take us back to housing uh, for a moment, there are two questions. One is, um, why isn't a lower price a good thing in terms of affordability oh. of housing? And that's from Roberto. I should also thank Brian for the question that I posed before yeah. about green energy. So Roberta asks about why is it a lower price not a good thing because it makes the home more affordable? And Lisa asks, what is the role of affordable housing in you know, helping build this black wealth? Well, nothing's wrong with um, affordable housing. It's just the differentiating, uh, it's the difference between uh, values of you, but you don't want you don't want a market in which the same house is valued one thing, and and another. I mean, you you don't want that kind of distortion. Um, um, with that said, many people um, can only afford to live in devalued areas, um, but we need to also look at why they are o only can afford those areas. Um, Housing devaluation is just the tip of the iceberg. We do need to look at employment discrimination. Um, the, nothing will ever be affordable if folks don't have quality jobs. You know, it, it, you know, the whole idea of affordable housing is a little bit of a cat and mouse game. Do we talk about affordable housing or do we talk about jobs? You know, and you know, I tend to talk about jobs because one of the things we see all the time, look at the um, the pay of black women. You know, for equal, you know, it should be equal pay for equal work, right? But it, that doesn't exist. Black women are, is, is on, and when you control for profession and education, all those sorts of things, black women are the lowest paid folks. And um, so they just don't have the buying power as their colleagues. So. Um, I look at it this way. You don't want unequal values in the same metropolitan area. You do want people to have um, wages that will make homes affordable. Um, and you do want the right amount of density so that we don't create um, supply demand issues that, that heighten price. And so, um, there's a lot of in the ecosystem, housing ecosystem that needs to be corrected. Um, but I'm on that side. Let's not, nothing's affordable if you don't have quality, nothing. Uh, you are wearing that wonderful beast shirt. And as you said before, we are in front of an audience that includes a lot of students and many individuals who have asked, what can we do? How can we help? So you've talked a lot about policies and governments yeah. and federal, et cetera. So I have a question from Fiona that I think is echoed by many students. Uh, students who upon graduation uh, may enter new communities or cities for job opportunities. How can we put conscientiousness into practice? Those young adults who will start having more significant financial choices since they're entering the workforce, what are the some of the best ways to incorporate BIPOC investment? I mean, Black in particular, I think for this conversation yeah. here, Black History Month, and so investment and support into our everyday decision making. Look, let me tell you, I'm going to tell the students right now, thank goodness for young people. Because if it was not for young people marching in these streets, I probably wouldn't be here right now. Young people are actually already doing it. You know, not not that all students on this. I mean, we have some adult students as well, uh, but um, young people are doing it. In actuality, the in for um, the one bright spot in terms of housing um, and home ownership, Black millennials actually showed an increase in home ownership during the pandemic. An increase because in, um, a lot of young people live in. Um, cities 
And instead of, I mean, they couldn't spend their money on fancy clothes and bars. So guess what? They saved their money and they're buying in devalued areas and um, purchasing homes. Um, but more importantly, I don't, I don't ever lose sight that the people who are marching in the streets were largely young, multiracial, making demands. My generation, or my peers, I should say, I was making those demands. I was in those streets uh, when I was a young and, um, but many of my, my colleagues that I graduated with were not. And so I think there is a heightened awareness um, among young people. I think where you start to get it into some conflict is that a lot of people who march in those streets when they have kids and they say, oh, where are you gonna send their, your, your kids to school? Then they're like, oh, um, let's preserve our little enclave here. Uh, that's when it becomes a problem. But in the main, young people are doing it. They're joining organizations. They are making demands. They're actually understanding money better than I did. Um, and so I actually think you guys are on the right, right track. The question, the real question is, how can old fogies like me learn from you? You know, are, I'm gonna challenge the faculty now. Are you writing with your students? Are you engaged in their activities? Are you being informed by the young people? That's the new challenge because, and I, and, and I, and I say this all the time, my interns, my research assistants, they bring the ideas, you know, that I may not see. I'm like, ooh, that's hot. Let me explore that. But it was the, the young folk who brought these ideas to the, the, the interns, the research assistants. They may not have had the, all the skills yet, um, but oftentimes they do have the skill. I mean, that's the other thing. They have the skills. I, I, I would say for young people, the thing to practice right now, writing. Learn how to write well. You know, if you can master um, how to write a, an op-ed, a white paper, a research paper of some type, um, man, if you can get those two things down, uh, you'll be good um, and learn some technical skills, you know, get some statistics down, uh, you know, uh, learn, learn some, um, you know, some, get some hard skills, but learn how to write. Um, and, but that's where your faculty need to step up. Faculty need to, to say, Hey, you know what? I'm going to put you on this paper. Um, and because writing papers is funny, uh, writing sort of esoteric academic papers, you know, you really don't learn how to write. It's when you have to go to Congress and put words on paper. You better, you better be tight, better be tight. It's when you, people want, people want to go on MSNBC and and they want to be in the New York Times and this and that. The product better be tight. And so I, I, I say this to young people, you got the energy, you got the brain, the creativity, the intelligence, learn how to write. Get that down. Practice, practice. And, and, I'll, and I'll be honest with you, I started, I started writing in, you know, in school newspaper. Um, any chance I get, I would write in whatever venue I, that I was afforded. And, and um, I started writing in a black newspaper when, um, when I got my PhD, that turned into um, NPR, that turned into uh, national stuff. Um, but it, it all became about responding to the needs of people through the written word. So I'm a big fan of learning how to write. I, mean, I think that's a good way to close. Thank you. I, well, I don't know if that's the answer that students thought that you were going to go is. with. What can we do? He said, learn how to write. Right. <laughs> but 
but but I, I will say, but what I do want to give props. Keep demanding change. Yeah. You know, my job as a researcher becomes a lot easier when young people are in those streets. You know, when folks are in the streets, but I, I think that's why I don't I don't have a problem with this generation at all. There's a lot of like yappity yap yap about the problems of this generation. I, and I go, look, who's in, who, who, somebody got their heads on right. I mean, there were some young people um, on the, on the on cap, uh, storming the Capitol, but you know, the, most of the young people, collegians I see are, are doing the right thing. They're, they're saying the right things. They got the right language. I, it's, it's the old folk I need to worry about. <laughs> Well, thank you so much, Dr. Perry. I think you answered what was going to be my last question. What's bringing you hope? I think the young people oh, yeah. very much an answer to that question. We cannot thank you enough for your words, for your time, for the information you shared with us, for your energy, for sharing your personal story. We have greatly benefited this evening from this conversation. And we look forward to going out and demanding the change and making the change and being the change that um, you're calling for in your work. Well, so Geese, let me tell you, thanks for the good gear. Uh, uh, I'll be wearing this as often as possible without my wife complaining. So um, thank you very much. Thank you. Have a good night. Good night to everyone. All right. Bye-bye.